uh, there's there's the idea of cooler storage, cooler as in less hot, as in um, not as available, but not lower as cost. in the 80s cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's me talking, so not that kind of cool. Mm. So welcome. Today is April 3rd, and today's Ask Some Praxis has all the members, including our newest member. Yay, Carrie, welcome. So. We have a new member, Carrie, and we're happy to have you here. Uh, and hopefully she might have some things to contribute sometime in the future. All right, today's topic is Microsoft 365 Site Lifecycle. And so this topic, we're going to be discussing uh, how site like life cycles can be handled, talking about disposition. We'll talk about some of the products, SharePoint Premium, their backup and archive uh, features, team archiving features, and automating uh, the life cycle. So let's get started with Mark, uh, and let's sort of talk about how we think about life cycles in general. Right. So um, Life cycle is, is something that applies to lots and lots of different sort of objects. If you think about it, you know, it, it, it applies to things in your house. It applies to things at the grocery store. It applies to content and sites in, in uh, SharePoint and Microsoft 365. So there are some uh, objects or containers that uh, life cycle is a little bit less important about. So for instance, for example, if you have an HR intranet site, it's not going to go away at some point. It, you know, you create it and it should last for as long as the organization lasts, sort of perpetual sites, if you will. Um, life cycle thinking also ought to apply to individual objects within sites. So should this document library have a life cycle? Should this document within this document li library have a life cycle? Should a list item have a life cycle? And if you think about it, almost everything should. Lots of times we focus on let's create stuff. And then we don't think about what happens next. And so that's that's a big part of what we're what we're trying to cover here. Sprawl is a complaint that people have because they don't think about life cycle. You know, if, if you see, you know, oh my God, we have a hundred sites. It's like, well, that's not actually a problem unless 95 of those aren't in use anymore. You know, so so that oftentimes the the fact that their sprawl is is considered a problem, but it's not if all of those sites are active and they're providing value and people are becoming more effective or efficient. The the picture on this slide is from our management of content competency in the in the maturity model for Microsoft 365. And I, I added it to the slide because this is the kind of thing that we think about. You know, within a team site, you create content, you iterate, you review, you publish. And and so that's a life cycle. And you have to think about how a life cycle like that might apply to the sites that you have within your tenant. Um, Greg mentioned that he wishes that teams would change delete to archive because users are deleting teams. Isn't there, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't when you delete a team, doesn't it like say, hey, you sure you want to delete this? So it feels a little extra from those those users, but I, I hear that. You sure. do get a warning, but yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. And and this the underlying site does go into the deleted sites recycle bin. No, they don't call it that for 30 days at least. So you you do have a, a fallback. You, know, you can save yourself. Yes. Derek, why are you raising your hand? That's weird. I pushed the button by mistake. <laughs> don't push the button, Derek. Don't. We always say don't push the button. <laughs> Especially Mark, don't press the big leave button today. Mm. Uh, that button is just it's so big and red and so up there yeah. in the right corner. Yeah, you know you want to hit it. Uh, but Casper, Casper, too. Casper yeah, can raise his hand. I can't. Ar archive of Teams, that's still there. I just used it the other day. Unless it's going away, that might be the case. We're going to actually even talk about it. So. Uh, oh, Ruth, does the Microsoft 365 group get restored if the site is restored? Yes, it does, Ruth. So everything comes back to life. Thank you, God. Um, sort of amazing that that works. It is a it little does. bit amazing. I have to agree. So maturity. Well, Casper, do you are you playing now with the button, 
Casper? No, no. I, actually, I, I just I, I had an, an issue with the, with the archive functionality being sort of like hidden away from from Teams because if you can archive a channel which is uh, mm -hmm. on the roadmap right now coming out, if you can do that, but you can't archive a site a team, but you can delete mm. it as a, as an owner. That makes zero sense in 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 my mind that you can do a destructive action, but you can't just store it. So oh, I see where you're going. So you're more discussing like it's not gone; it's just hidden deeply or not super visible. Yeah, that that I agree with you. Like archive should be sort of front and center over delete for sure. Um, delete being so destructive. Um, I totally agree with that. All right, Mark, maturity model. So, We're going to apply yeah, a maturity model as we. Well, are. there's always something in maturity model here. So yeah. you know, if if you think about it, um, you know, a lot of organizations are just gee, we have a lot of sites. What do we do about that? You know, they don't even know how to, how do we deal? How do we think? Um, next level up might be, you know, you've got some manual management of site life cycles on an irregular basis. Like, you know, huh, that looks like it hasn't been used in a while. I'll ask Bob if he still, if he still needs it, but it, but it's sort of more of an ad hoc thing. Um, at level 300, more established organizations probably have a, a clearer, you know, I want, I have a site request form or process. I provision things based on what the the need for the site is, what it should, how it should be structured, what people are going to do with it. And based on that kind of site, we think about how we can retire it. Retirement meaning, you know, uh, you know what I'll talk about on the next slide. Actually, I will talk about disposition on the next slide. Um, level 400, you probably have some sort of automated rules and policies that manage the site portfolio. So you're 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 you know knowing up front that this site is this kind of site, so it's naturally going to have this kind of uh, life lifespan and and a, and a disposition at the end. And then best of breed, sort of level 500, you probably have some sort of AI or rules-based analysis that's watching that site portfolio and actually making suggestions to you. Hey, did you know you have 12 sites that haven't been uh, touched in a while or they don't have owners or whatever to help manage that life cycle much, much better? Yeah, and we're going to go in a little bit more on that level 500 stuff towards the end, but I sort of wanted to also add at level 100, there's a lot of Nobody thinks about it until they run out of space and have to buy more space. And then they kind of freak out about the, um, we have lots of sites. It's not really that you have lots of sites that anybody particularly cares about. It's more like, hey, we have a lot of content and thereby we've used up the storage allocated to us and now we would have to buy more and it's pretty expensive. So having sort of, if you know that you're gonna be provisioning a lot of sites to maybe handle projects, or whatever, having a plan, you don't necessarily have to have a plan for day one, but having a plan for how you're gonna manage that content going forward is probably useful. It's actually interesting. I've talked to a lot of admins over the years who are just irked that there are so many sites. It's not about yeah. storage at all. They just, they, they feel like, well, people are using this too much. It's, I mean, yeah. they don't say it that way, but it's like, okay. we just have too many. And it's, it's I think like that's this just an admin existential, phobia. it's like this what? existential no, angst, Todd, you right? don't get it's to that speak. small thing. As the, as the token admin, <laughs> whoever that might be, I think it's just <laughs> like once you get more than one screen of stuff, I think it just gets scary. And I think that's what it is. Like like they can't just uh, go into the UI and, and easily click things. It's uh, John Holiday used to talk about the SharePoint for dummies. I think it was John Holiday that, you know, SharePoint was great if you could use it in, in the dummy mode, but once you get lots and lots of things, it just gets scary for some reason. I think that's what it is. Mike, chime in. But come off mute, so there you go. <laughs> I, have, I have a client right now that is actually struggling with storage. And the reason that they're struggling with it is because they recently had a major downsize. Oh. So my issue, because this is what the client wants to do. The client always wants to abuse OneDrive because for every license they get, they get a terabyte in OneDrive. Mm -hmm. But for every license they get, they only get, what is it, 400 megabytes added to the... I don't um, actually know what the number is. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, whatever that's not the right number. I don't know what it is, though. So. Yeah, I, I don't remember what it is either, but it's wildly skewed towards promoting bad practice. Yeah. Oh, that drives me crazy. Yeah, yep. that's pretty terrible. 
I agree with you, Mike. Yep, because that same company probably also doesn't have good stuff in place for when the license gets deactivated and the OneDrive gets deleted. You know, managers finding out, so then one day that that worksheet that's the most important one in the company is gone, and they don't know why or how. Yeah, right? I, I mean, I think I think we, I, we need to also think of, of people's OneDrives as a site, which is effectively what they are. They're they're the old my site, so it's part of your site topology, even though it doesn't show up in the active sites listing in the admin center. Yeah, the, so, I don't make them especially easy to manage, though. No, no, they do not. All right. So speaking of deleting, oh, Casper, go ahead. That was just a suggestion that well, they, they might uh, look into uh, intelligent uh, uh, versioning, which is coming up right now. Uh, and if they enable that, then they will automatically strip uh, some of the versions on some of the files, and that could bring down the total uh, storage uh, consumption. Uh, and, yeah. and it's for it's for free. It's actually for free. It's not in Share, SharePoint Premium or anything. It's for free. Well, I think that's saving their own skin a little bit too, right? So that makes sense to me why they'd want that. Uh, okay, Mark again, site disposition. All right, so what what do we do when something reaches the end of its life cycle? You know, we have we have various options. We don't have to just do one thing for everything. So, you know, in some cases you just delete it. You know, it's it's time to get rid of it. Uh, in other cases, you want to think about some kind of archiving, and this could be this could be phased or staged archiving, depending on what kind of container this is. And we're talking mostly about sites, but I say containers because, again, this sort of applies up and down the, the chain. So when you're archiving something, you know, historically, what we always did was we just archived big air quotes in place, meaning we just left it there. Right. So that's a strategy, even though it sounds sort of lame. Some things need to stay in place because you might need them at any moment. So, you know, you don't necessarily want to, you know, delete them or, or shuffle them off somewhere else. There's also now, um, and Derek will talk a little bit about this, is uh, there's there's the idea of cooler storage. Cooler as in less hot, as in um, not as available, but not lower as cost. as in the 80s cool? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's me talking, so not that kind of cool. Um, and then the, another option for archiving might be to take that content and put it offline somewhere. It's not in Microsoft 365 anymore. You, you just want the documents in a site, for example, so you write them off to a thumb drive. I mean, there, there are all kinds of different ways that you could think about this depending on what that content is. So there shouldn't be a one size fits all thinking here. And if you think about that maturity model, Toward the bottom, you're going to have more one size fits all. It's a site. I've got to deal with all the sites the same way. That should not be the case. It should be driven by um, what the site's purpose is, what its contents are, who's been working with it, what kind of regulatory or legal um, requirements you have around the content that's in there. So always be thinking about segmentation. You know, what, what are the segments of sites, the segments of containers we have, and how do we manage them? All right, that's Word. good advice. I agree. Derek, talk Excellent. to us about the new SharePoint Premium label. Yes. So, um, is we've that like got top shelf liquor? <laughs> yes. Yes. It's it's top shelf SharePoint. Um, <laughs> what one of the features that is par bundled up inside of SharePoint Premium, although you do have to pay for it, um, in addition to the premium license, is Microsoft 365 Archive. And essentially, and you know, Mark hit on this earlier, is that it really is in place cold storage for SharePoint related content. It lets you very quickly and easily take a site, bring it offline, you know, mark it essentially as read only. Um, it takes it out of findability and marks it read only for everybody except the purview managers and the admins, like global admins. Um, that's a really good thing because it means all the content is still governed by your retention policies, your sensitivity labels, e-discovery, it's all of that. So you can still go back and get access to that data. It's a really good thing for folks that, um, I know we have a lot, of, a lot of clients that are sort of hesitant to delete stuff, because 
they may need it for regulatory reasons. Some auditor may come back, blah, blah, blah. Like there's, and so they end up sitting on terabytes and terabytes of data just in case. And this is a really good option for that. Um, I added a picture here. Um, this is the active site screen. So it's very simple. You can click on an item and you can archive it. Um, and then you can get a listing of all of those sites that are archived and restore them. Um, it is pay as you go. And one of the things that I thought was interesting was that it is pay as you go, but only after you've hit your quota. So if you're, you know, if you haven't hit your quota yet, and you can and you're paying for SharePoint premium, you can archive sites and until you hit that quota, you're not paying for anything. I would venture a guess of there are actually there is a there is a charge for the storage, which at, on the on the preview site, it's five cents per gigabyte, but there is a charge to restore. So it's 0.5 gigabytes or 0.5 or five cents a gigabyte to just hang on to it. It's 60 cents a gigabyte to restore it. So if you need to get it back, that's problematic uh, or at least more <laughs> costly. A couple of things to think about with this. Um, number one is if you are using M365 backup, um, you can't archive a site that's assigned for backup. Oh, and as far as I can tell, this is only storing the share, doing the SharePoint data. If you archive a SharePoint site that is the back end for Teams, you're losing your Teams chat. You're losing all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, last thing on this is that this is being right now. This is in a uh, public preview. And I believe it is a paid preview, although I did not click the link to find out. Um, there's a link to it on in the resources. So if you are interested, you can check it out. The roadmap says it's supposed to roll out, start rolling out to GA this month or last month. So but the item hasn't been updated yet, hasn't been updated in a while. So we'll see when it actually goes GA. Cool. Good details. All right. Yeah. So we go ahead, Mark. I think I, I think maybe you said something, but the uh, the recovery fee doesn't kick in for 30 days. Like if you archive something by accident. No, nope. you say that? it's it's not 30 days. It is seven. Seven. I did not okay. say that. Sorry, but it is. Sorry. Yeah, you get because a seven day long. grace period. Yeah, <laughs> but that, that it, it makes it a little, little bit less scary to hit that button because yeah. you can actually bring it back within seven days. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, it may not be that big of a hit. I think the bigger issue is if you're going to. Constantly. If you're using it as like a stopgap and you're constantly archiving and restoring, archiving, restoring, archiving, and restoring, that's when it's really going to hit you pretty hard. Yeah. So, yeah. The one thing on that, Julia, that I that I noticed is reading the fine print. If you need to like export or download all the documents for e-discovery, you have to restore all of the sites that you need to get the data from. Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, that so. could be pretty costly. But if yeah. you're if you need e-discovery, you're probably in costly zone anyway. So maybe <laughs> not. Maybe <laughs> not. Point. Not your biggest right. concern. At not that your biggest concern at that point. Okay, so we were talking about archiving a team a little bit earlier. Essentially, what archiving a team does is it makes the team read only. So uh, you can still add and remove members, and uh, private channels are also affected. So just know that. Uh, SharePoint is also effective, affected, excuse me, if you check the box. So if you look at the screenshot I put on the right, when you go and pick archive, it gives you this, you know, warning that it's freezing activity or everything. And then you can check the box that says make the SharePoint site read only for team members as well. And then it's temporarily hidden in the hidden team section. And then sometime that it didn't allude to, it moves from being in the hidden team section to an archive team sections. And this is in the Teams Explorer on the left-hand side of uh, your Teams app. So that is what archiving a team means. Okay, uh, automation. So this is where we sort of can talk about that level 500 type of maturity for uh, your solution. So we have a couple of things. I put roll your own first. And so the idea behind this is that you could create scripting or timer jobs and based on some metadata somewhere, which could be SharePoint lists, external systems, 
uh, lots of other metadata that's on the sites, groups, et cetera, you could automate archiving. And so there is a handy little feature in ShareGate called export, which is a PowerShell command. So as an admin, somebody who wants to script things, you could use that export uh, solution to export the content from your SharePoint site into um, basically a file folder. So the documents go in folders and the um, list data goes into Excel uh, files. And so then you're essentially archiving that content. Um, similar to that, once you do that, and if you're running writing sort of admin-y type scripts, you can move that content into more let's say le more cost-effective cold storage or very cold storage by using Azure storage, which has three levels of archiving sort of that it costs even less than the SharePoint uh, storage. So if you're more mature, you are a bigger organization with a lot more content to archive, maybe rolling your own or coming up with some sort of archiving solution like that would be useful. Now, granted, by doing that, you do not maintain the uh, you know, e-discovery, retention labels, and all of that kind of stuff that you might be using in your tenant. So you have to make a very thoughtful decision about what can be archived by actually getting it out of your tenant versus what needs to sort of be discoverable by SharePoint, right? And again, you could do other things to sort of mitigate that, but now you're really, you know, you're reaching high for uh, automation. And the other thing I want to bring up is Orchestry, which is one of our partners that we talk about pretty frequently, uh, has an entire lifecycle management feature built into their platform. It's part of their uh, standard offering. And what it does, it, in general, it's based off of inactivity. And maybe that is not the way that you would uh, consider something needing to be archived or not. But there is a way, because they hook, they give you hooks into uh, everything, that you could have your own sort of, this is sort of a, a combination of roll your own and orchestry by creating timer jobs or whatever that trigger off of external you know type of information something else a sharepoint list a sql server database some third party system that triggers archiving and then you can trigger a lifecycle policy to be applied to that site in orchestry and then orchestry will will execute the archive policy and so there are there are archive policies you can create an archive policy for teams sharepoint and viva engage it uh, archives both uh, all documents and lists very similar to the sharegate export uh, feature but also will export uh, an archive teams channel post which was a pretty big value add in my opinion that's that's a pretty that you know, because we were talking about SharePoint Archive is only the SharePoint site. This is actually giving you some team stuff as well. Um, so I, I mentioned that they have these HTTP inter integrations so that you can, when an archive is complete, you can trigger uh, uh, an HTTP endpoint to do additional work if you need to. And of course you have notifications and approvals for those uh, policies if you want to, um, or if that makes sense for you. So all in all, the orchestry lifecycle management feature is pretty robust and um, and can manage a lot of things. And then adding in that ability to do HTTP in integrations by either triggering something to start an archive and or triggering something to happen after something is archived uh, can be really robust. Uh, so that is what I had to say on automation. And so moving forward, we have a bunch of resources. We have um, a link for a maturity model, uh, a link for the Microsoft 365 archive. So getting started on that and an overview of that archive in preview, uh, archiving and deleting a team in Microsoft Teams and an, a, a link to the export site PowerShell command, as well as a link to orchestry. Uh, so if you have any interest in any of those, you can check it out. Do we have any questions in the chat that I should address? I haven't been reading since I've been talking. I'd be interested to hear how people who have joined us are 
thinking about life cycle management in their organizations? Are, are there other approaches that you're taking that we haven't talked about? Yeah, we do have a few minutes if anybody wants to come off mute. I'll leave us on, well, actually you can navigate yourself, so I'll stop at our last slide. If anybody had anything they wanted to add, we do have a few minutes. Oop, Casper. That's just, this, this is just my, my bread and butter, so, so I, of course, have, have delved uh, into this uh, quite a lot. And also that uh, the, the idea that we can strip down the, the file versions, people are over, uh, haven't really paid attention to that one for a while. And I hope that we'll see Microsoft kind of take the approach for both for, for team channels and for teams and for SharePoint sites that we can build in this, the option to actually use this um, Microsoft 365 archive functionality if that is of course enabled on your tenant it might not be so so i hope that we'll see some some development on that uh, on that part uh, pretty soon i hope because but both all of the products are there so they just need to integrate them yeah and the sharepoint uh the sharegate export command allows you to strip off versioning and i believe orchestries does too uh mike i think you had your hand up first go yeah, so uh, the, we're, we've we've got yet again the uh, the jacked up way to do it, which is to back everything up in Veeam and then just delete it from the SharePoint tenant and uh, recover from Veeam as needed. Hmm. Interesting. It's it's not actually yeah, it's a, how I'd recommend doing it, but it saves a lot of money on storage. And some of the backup providers, there. I mean, you can restore whole sites down to individual documents from a particular time frame. I mean, it, that that traditional approach has, is actually pretty mature, I think, but it's very much an admin focused. I mean, you know, an end user can't really do much about that. They have to ask no, you to do it. I don't think end users can do much about many of the things, although the yeah. archive feature, that's true. The archive feature, the user can press the button. So although that makes me now a little scared thinking about it because that 60 <laughs> cent thing, back and forth and back and forth. And they're like, what do you mean? I, th I thought I could do this every single day, yeah, you know, $1,000 later. Steve, what do you have to add to our discussion? Well, I have a I have a question about ShareGate's management um, web-based program because they provide an archive, and I was wondering if anybody had any experience using that. Yeah, that I think I'm talking about the export command that I don't think they call it archive. I think they call it export, and that was the PowerShell command that I was talking about, but you can also do that from the UI. There's an export command in the ShareGate UI that does the same thing. It's the user's ability, or the ShareGate user's ability to do the same thing. Right. Both both ShareGate and Orchestry have built their own uh, archiving capability that, that is separate from what SharePoint Premium is doing. So different cost impact there as well. OK, that's great. I didn't know the export command was um, the same as the 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 UI. Mm -hmm. It seemed like they I haven't I haven't looked into it for a while, but it seems like they also had a, a tiered approach where it was available for restore within 30 days. And then after that, you had to, um, you know, it wasn't as avail uh, available. But oh, I, that I don't know. They did. I think that's a choice. Um, uh, sort of, it, it, it's, it's um, um, blah, blah, blah. I believe it's sort of that stage thing where, you know, you might want something to be archived in place and then archived a little more permanently and then archived a lot, you know? So over right. time okay. you would, you would uh, vary where, that content actually ends up. No, They're I think probably with, just make it read only, right? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I I can talk about ShareGate because I know them pretty well. No, I think with ShareGate, Steve, you can get it back whenever you want. Um, one of the things to consider though is that when it does the archival, and either it goes into their Azure storage or you can configure it into your Azure storage as well, it is encrypted, and the yeah. only way you can unarchive it is you still need um, a ShareGate license ah. for it. So yeah. that's something that's in the fine print. But apart from that, they do an awesome job. Um, so you can choose to either have them store it for European customers. It is stored within a, within a US data center. You don't have any choice, but you can also hook up your own Azure storage, which is super easy to do um, around that as well. But they do a good job. It, it's it's definitely awesome. And you're right, oh, Judy. It's the, the same command PowerShell versus doing it through the UI. You get the same thing. 
That's same, what same I thought. Result. Yeah, so for the you. most part, the PowerShell and ShareGate just creates jobs the same way the UI does. So if you do a copy command in Share in PowerShell, you can watch it in the UI because it's just submitting jobs to the same engine. Yeah. Very cool. Good to know too. Thanks. Awesome. Well, we are at time. Uh, our next episode, April 17th, is going to be page layouts and talking about building great home pages. And as always, next week, I am at the North American Cloud and Collaboration Summit. Uh, so and I'll look to see, say hello to anybody who's there. Uh, the uh, Orlando event, Carrie, Derek, and myself will be there. And then European Collaboration Summit, Derek and I, and TechCon 365 in Seattle is Derek. So please say hello to us if you are at any of those events or use our discount codes to join us. And with that, I say thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Ask and Praxis. We love getting your questions or session ideas. You can submit by using the link in about. If you find this helpful, hit that like or subscribe button and share this content with your colleagues. 